You're listening to the St John's Diamond Creek Podcast. This episode presented by Senior Minister Tim Johnson. Today's reading is from Galatians 4, verses 4 to 11. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, but that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit that calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have washed my efforts, wasted my efforts on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, our current teaching series is called You Do You. We're thinking about identity, about who we are and about how we work out who we are. The main approach to identity in our current culture is what's called expressive individualism. That the primary place that you should look to work out who you are is inside yourself. You discover or even construct your identity by looking at yourself. And external influences that might shape you are to be rejected so that you can pursue authenticity and freedom. We've based the series on on this book by Brian Rosner, How to Find Yourself and Why Looking Inward is Not the Answer. And analysing and critiquing this viewpoint against what the Bible has to say. To help us think more about that today, I want to show you a short ad released by General Pants in 2019, which I came across recently when watching a lecture on identity by Christopher Watkin. This ad seeks to appeal to Gen Z or Gen Z, hence the play on words with using Gen P. There's a clear reaction to and rejection of previous generations, but their negative uh, stereotyping. Criticising the current generation uh, for their time wasting and their laziness. Now, there's nothing new there. Every single generation reacts to the generations before them, and also criticises the generations that come after them. Uh, Listen to this criticism. The young people of today think of nothing but themselves. They've no reverence for parents or old age. They're impatient of all restraint. They talk as if they knew everything, and what passes for wisdom with with us is foolishness with them. As for the girls, They are forward, immodest, and unladylike in speech, behaviour, and dress. 
Now that sounds very modern, doesn't it? But it was written 850 years ago by a guy called Peter the Hermit. So the Gen P ad celebrates inclusion and authenticity, key features of expressive individualism. And it expresses a longing for community. The first part of the tagline is, we are Gen P. Now, as Joel spoke about last week, humans have been made for relationships and community. And we can't actually understand our identity to know who we are apart from relationships. But the Gen P ad expresses a tension. Listen to how the ad agency describes the concept that they were going for. The the brand introduces Gen P, a collective of individuals who are united by their individuality and a shared ethos, living beyond the boundaries of conformity. So it's a collective, there's the community and the relationship, but what is shared is individuality and non-conformity. You know, we're all individuals together and we're all united in our non-conformity. Again, this is not a new tension as every generation seeks to define itself against what went before. Uh, This cartoon captures it well. In seeking to define identity in opposition to something else, to be non-conformists, we can tend to all look like each other in our non-conformity. That was true of the punk subculture which emerged in the mid-1970s as much as anything we see today. But most interesting to me in this ad is the second part of the tagline, led by none. As we've seen, a key aspect of expressive individualism is that no one should tell us who we are and what we can be. We reject external influences and look inside ourselves. We reject external authority and we make moral choices based on our own feelings and desires. We are led by none. But notice the irony here. Who's promoting this idea of led by none? This is a marketing campaign by a clothing brand with an annual revenue of $141 million. They are seeking to influence and lead people by using the slogan, led by none. If you buy these clothes, then you can have this identity. You can be part of this collective of individuals. You can be led by none. My point in all this is is definitely not to make fun of any particular generation, and especially not Gen Z. Every single generation reacts to the previous generations, and every single generation criticises the generations below them. We're all inconsistent when it comes to determining our identity. We're all grasping to answer the question, who am I? This is the challenge of identity. It's really hard to know who you are. And it's made more difficult by the fact that we're constantly being co-opted and manipulated by others for their purposes like clothing brands that want our money and so encourage us to buy into a certain identity. That's why we need something solid to ground our sense of identity in. If our identity is determined primarily by looking inside ourselves, then that's fragile and unstable. It makes us more vulnerable to manipulation by marketers and brands because we think we're drawing an identity from within, but all of us are so heavily influenced by our culture, whatever culture we're living in. And so today I want us to think especially about our identity in relation to God. If it's true that there is a God, a God who exists before all things and exists 
independently of us and of the world, then that's a solid reference point and a strong grounding for understanding our own identity as humans and as individuals. I want us to think about three aspects of identity in relation to God today. That you are made in the image of God, you are known by God, and you are a child of God. Firstly, you are made in the image of God. One of the most fundamental parts of the Christian faith is that there is a God and this God made us. We learn that in the first chapter of the Bible. And in Genesis 1.27, we read, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So fundamental to our identity is that we are created by God. That is, we stand in a dependent relationship to a God who made us. We are creatures and he is our creator. More than that, he also sustains us day by day and minute by minute. The next breath you take, the next beat of your heart happens because God is sustaining us and enabling our life. If that's true, then you cannot fully know who you are by looking inward. You need to look upward to the God who made you. The great 16th century theologian John Calvin wrote, a person never attains to a true self-knowledge until he has previously contemplated the face of God and come down after such contemplation to look into himself. If you want to know who you are, then you need to think about the God who made you and then examine yourself in relation to your creator God. That's especially true because human beings are made in the image of God. We're made to reflect God's character in our lives. Joel spoke last week about the fact that God is relational. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so from eternity past, he's existed in loving relationship in and of himself. So as people made in God's image, we're also hardwired for relationship. But we also reflect other aspects of God's character. Our own creativity is a reflection of God the creator. Our own intelligence and reason reflects God as designer and one who brings order. Our ability to use complex language reflects a God who speaks and communicates. Every beautiful aspect of your personhood and identity is a reflection of God's beauty and character. Now, by very definition, an image is derived from and dependent on the thing that it is imaging. So for us as image bearers to simply look inwards, means that we'd only ever examine the image and not the original. Hence Calvin's call to contemplate the face of God. If you want to know truly who you are, if you want to know your authentic self, then you need not only to look inward, but upward. You cannot know who you are apart from God. So you're made in the image of God. But secondly, you are known by God. This brings us to our Bible reading today from Galatians 4. Listen again to verses 8 and 9. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Before the Galatians 
had heard about Jesus, before they'd entered into a relationship with the true and living God through Jesus, they were enslaved. They worshipped and served things other than God, idols. And they were influenced and manipulated by cultural forces and spiritual powers. But now they've heard the good news of Jesus, that his death on the cross frees us from slavery to sin and idolatry, that his resurrection defeats the powers of death, darkness and destruction. Now, Paul writes, you know God. But then he stops and he corrects himself. Or rather, are known by God. Why does he make that correction? See, it's, it is important that we know God. Paul spent his life telling people about God and the way to know God through Jesus. We all need to grow in our understanding of God and to share what we know about God with others. Our church mission statement is, know Jesus, make Jesus known. But here, Paul stops and says, as important as it is for us to know God, even more important is it that we are known by God. Being known by God emphasises the gracious initiative of God towards us, that he knows us before we know him. That's true in human relationships too. Think about the relationship between a newborn baby and her mother. The baby knows her mother by smell and touch, being fed and nourished. But the mother knows more about her baby, what she looks like, what she needs, the causes of her distress, what's best for her and what will enable her to flourish. Indeed, the mother knew her baby while she was still growing in the womb. And that same language is used in the Bible for God's knowing us too. God says to the prophet Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Uh, the psalmist says to God in Psalm 139, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. God knew us before we knew him, and he knows us more intimately and deeply than we even know ourselves. Last week, Joel showed us the Jahari window. See, there are areas of our lives that are known to us and known to others. But there are areas of our lives that we know, but we keep secret from others. And there are things that other people know about us, which are blind spots to us. But there's also parts of our identity that are unknown to both us and to others. But they're not unknown to God. God sees into the very depths of our souls. God knows the secrets that we desperately try to keep hidden from other people. God sees the blind spots that we conceal from ourselves. God knows everything about you. And he loves you. That's such an incredible truth for us to grasp. God knows everything about us and he loves us still. We often live in constant fear that if people really knew what we were like, then they'd reject us and turn away in disgust. In our closest friendships and relationships with people who know us most intimately, there's a sense of safety and security because we know that they see our faults and failings, and yet incredibly, they still love us. It's even more so with God. He knows us more intimately than our dearest friend or our lifelong spouse. He knows our true identity even better than we do 
and he loves us. Now that's especially helpful to know when we're in the midst of great hardship. When life is really tough and our identity is shaken, when we're rejected by people who are close to us, abandoned by friends or a long-term relationship ends, when things that were core to our self-understanding come crashing down, you know, we get retrenched, suddenly find ourselves unemployed, or we fail to make the cut for that sports team that we've trained for years and years to get into. Who are we then? Where's our identity to be found? It's here that we most especially need to rest in the truth that we are known by God. There's a beautiful verse in Psalm 56, verse 8. This is how the New Living Translation puts it as the psalmist addresses God. You keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. We are known by God, especially in times of distress. God knows our pains and our heartaches. Even if we are struggling to know who we are at these times, even if we are struggling to know who God is or where God is, God knows us. God loves us. God is collecting our very tears in his bottle. So key to your identity is that you're made in the image of God and you are known by God. But thirdly, you are a child of God. Brian Rosner wrote an earlier book called Known by God, where he examines the Bible to understand what that phrase means, what it means to be known by God. And he says that at the very core of this idea is being a child of God. Now, we saw that in verses 5 to 7 of our Bible reading, where Paul writes about our adoption to sonship. Let me read. God sent his son that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent his son, in, sorry, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now, that gender-exclusive language of sonship might be jarring. The translator stuck with the word sonship because in the ancient world, it was only male heirs who could inherit from their fathers. But we don't need the gendered language to understand the truth expressed here because it applies to all of us regardless of gender. Through Jesus, God has adopted us as his children. And as his children, he sent his spirit into our hearts so that we're able to call God Abba, Father. There's an intimacy available to us because the Holy Spirit lives in us. That just as in the same way my children can call me dad, so we too can call our creator, the all-powerful and eternal God, dad too. We're no longer slaves to sin and death and evil, but we're God's children. And as his children, we are heirs. All the blessings that belong to Jesus, the son, all the things that Jesus has won by his perfect life, his sacrificial death, his mighty resurrection, all of the riches of Jesus are given to us too. Because through Jesus, God lovingly opens his arms and welcomes us into the family. So at the heart of your identity, core to who you are, is that you are a child of God. You are his daughter. You are his son. 
You've been adopted into the family. When I was at Bible college, I did a short-term placement with the Salvation Army. And one of the interns working there had a, had a tattoo on her wrist. And it was written in Hebrew. Now, being the Bible nerd that I am, I asked if I could have a look and to see if I could translate it. It simply read, Bator, his daughter. There it was, in permanent ink, as a daily reminder to her of who she is, of her identity, his daughter. Through Jesus, we belong to God and can call him dad. Even if our own families were lousy and hurtful, even if we weren't nurtured and loved appropriately, God says, now you're part of my family. You are my child. You belong to me. So in order to know ourselves truly and authentically, we need to look upward as well as inward. As you look to God, you see that you are made in his image, you are known by God, and you are a child of God. These are powerful truths for understanding your identity because they're truths that come from outside yourself. They are objectively true and not merely subjective. They don't change depending on how you feel about yourself today. They provide you with a solid foundation for grounding your life and your identity. I want to finish by reading a poem written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a theologian living in Nazi Germany and he was sent to a prison camp for his role in a plot against Hitler. He was killed a short time before the Allies liberated the prison camp. And this poem was written by Bonhoeffer from that prison camp as he struggled and reflected on his identity in the midst of that terrible place. How was he to know who he was? And how was he to reconcile what other people said about him and saw in him with what he saw as he looked inward in self-reflection? Where was the solid ground for his identity to be found? The poem's called, Who Am I? Who am I? They often tell me I step from my cell's confinement, calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire from his country house. Who am I? They often tell me I used to speak to my warders freely and friendly and clearly, as though it were mine to command. Who am I? They also tell me I bore the days of misfortune equally, smilingly, proudly, like one accustomed to win. Am I then really all that which other men tell of? Or am I only what I myself know of myself, restless and longing and sick, like a bird in a cage, struggling for breath as though hands were compressing my throat, yearning for colours, for flowers, for the voices of birds, thirsting for words of kindness, for neighbourliness, tossing in expectation of great events powerlessly trembling for friends at an infinite distance, weary and empty at praying, at thinking, at making, faint and ready to say farewell to it all. Who am I? This or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once, a hypocrite, before others and before myself, a contemptibly woebegone weakling? Or is something within me still like a beaten army fleeing in disorder from victory already achieved? Who am I? 
They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek.